Many Christians have different views on Bible topics, especially Genesis. Is there a specific way we should interpret the Bible? This week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. I'm Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Our topic this week is how should the Bible be interpreted? Big topic. Uh oh, who no. picked this topic? Yeah. You could lose some <laughs> friends. Uh, the topic of interpretation, of course, is of, of Scripture is a huge issue and has caused yeah. a lot of division amongst Christians. And many sincere believers in, in, in Jesus as Lord and Savior have come to pretty well, you know, different conclusions about various yeah. Yeah. Uh, topics based on the reading of the same Bible. But, but does that mean that the Bible can mean anything you want it to mean? Right. What we want to do this week is give you the basic tools, just basic tools of interpretation. And of course, this being Creation Magazine Live, we're going to reference various interpretations of Genesis as examples. Right. Now, our, our website, creation.com, has several articles dealing with the authority of Scripture and interpretation. And one of the articles was inspired by a commenter who had objected to where um, we had made the comment that a proper interpretation of Genesis would lead you to a, a biblical or young earth um, interpretation of scripture. Right. So being a theistic evolutionist, he, he said the following, I'm questioning the authority of your interpretation of scripture. You state that young earth creationism is the only conclusion one could arrive at using sound exegetical principles. Given all of the biblical scholars who are both well educated on the topic of scripture and sincere in their faith who are in favor of theistic evolution, I am immediately suspicious of the authority of your claims. Furthermore, I must ask, from whence did these principles come? The Bible does not contain a book of exegesis, or for my part, I can't think of anywhere in the Bible where it expounds upon how to interpret Scripture. From this, I can't help but notice that your claim of biblical authority is entirely dependent on the authority of your exegesis. If said exegesis is not outlined in Scripture, then it is a creation of man. Therefore, you are in fact relying on the authority of man. Okay, well, mm -hmm. there's some good points there, and it is true that CMI's views are dependent on our exegesis of Scripture. Right. However, we believe that they uh, are derived from Scripture right. and are logically supported and can be defended against anyone questioning our interpretation. That's what we're going to do today a little bit. Right. However, we, and, and Bible skeptics as well, could ask many difficult questions to Christians holding the views like the, the person who wrote in. Exactly. Uh, for example, is there anywhere a universal method of interpretation, a, a, a set of sound exegetical principles outlined in Scripture. If there is, what is it? Right. And, and if there isn't a, a universal way of interpreting Scripture, doesn't that mean that all interpretations of Scripture are simply a creation right. of man yeah. and therefore not authoritative? Um, and if there isn't a, a universal way of interpreting Scripture, what does scriptural authority even mean? Right. What, what about if an educated Bible scholar, sincere in their faith, says, for example, that homosexual marriage, abortion, euthanasia, right. uh, things like that, uh, is proper? Those things are proper. Does that mean that those views are okay for a Christian to hold? Yeah. Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, what are the principles of exegesis that would lead you to that conclusion? If yes, then explain why. Uh, does the simple fact that there are well-educated Bible scholars, sincere in their faith, that teach theistic evolution as a viable interpretation of Genesis, does that mean that theistic evolution is derived from sound exegetical principles? Right. I mean, as you can see, any person taking a stance that says there are no rules of interpretation devised from Scripture is actually shooting themselves in the yeah, foot. Yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, a skeptic would make short work of a Christian who had this kind of attitude about the Word of God. And, and if they, the Christian, right. uh, holding that view uh, became consistent, they would come to doubt their faith very seriously when they realized that the, well, the Bible could mean anything you want it to mean, right? Yeah. Any, any yeah. view. Um, and, so, and next we'll look at some basic rules of interpretation and uh, also how Jesus and the disciples understood scripture when we get back. 
Stromatolites are regarded by many as the oldest fossils on Earth. They are interpreted as the remains of colonies of blue-green algae, or more accurately, cyanobacteria. The oldest ones are claimed to be 3.5 billion years old. Within this evolutionary perspective, one would expect these colonies to have radically changed, but remarkably, they are essentially the same today. Stromatolites, therefore, are classic examples of living fossils. Living fossils cause major problems for evolution because they provide stunning examples of how evolution hasn't occurred. They also call into question the evolutionary time frame. Some people try to downplay the significance of living fossils by arguing that when something is well adapted to its environment, it doesn't need to change. But this would need the environment to be constant for the supposed period of time. This argument cannot apply to stromatolites because during 3.5 billion years of alleged evolutionary time, many radical environment changes supposedly occurred, including the arrival of new predators and parasites. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, if you just tuned in, today we're talking about how should the Bible be interpreted. That's our topic today. That's right, a big topic. Okay, so, so to be a Christian means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Right. Obviously. And uh, accepting who Jesus is and following his teachings, beginning with the understanding that you are a sinner in need of salvation, that Christ, the eternal God-man, died for your sins, and, and that he rose from the dead, allowing your salvation from eternal punishment, and that this salvation is by grace, not by works, not by right. anything you've done. Yeah. Um, and, and this knowledge is given through the revelation in the Bible. But there'd be no way to verify this if the words in the Bible could not be taken at face value. Of course. So yeah. if there was no way to know who Jesus is and, and what he believed, then there'd be no way to be a Christian. Right. And this is why true Christians throughout history have held to the same core beliefs and why their writings acknowledge these beliefs. For example, the ancient Apostles' Creed said that Jesus, quote, suffered and died and uh, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died and was buried, and the third day he rose from the dead. Now, this creed is derived from a plain reading of Scripture. You're just taking the, the, the words that are there and understanding the words as they're written. Right. And the New Testament clearly records as a, a simple historical narrative the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. It should be obvious that if there's no objective method to interpret Scripture, then Christians are truly without hope regarding anything in the Bible, right. any biblical understanding. So it should be taken as history, uh, or, or should it be taken as history? Maybe it should be allegory. Maybe it's allegorical. If that can't be nailed down, then all things, including Christ's death and resurrection, would become open to anyone's interpretation. And even the fundamentals of the faith couldn't be truly known. Exactly. On the contrary, Scripture had supreme authority for the Old Testament saints, Christ, right. his apostles, yeah. and, and, and in all matters it touched on. Um, for Jesus, what Scripture said was what God said. Right, yeah. Right. Foundational to all theological studies is the concept of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science of properly interpreting the various types of literature found in the Bible. Uh, this is foundational for any Christian who truly wants to hear what God is saying to us through Scripture and not what they want it to say or what they feel it should say. Right. Uh, hermeneutics is a science in a sense. You, yeah. you look at the Scripture and it's a way of uh, getting the meaning from the text that's there. Right. A critical difference between methods of interpretation is the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. Right, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, exegesis is a method of interpretation that strives to understand the original meaning out of the biblical text. Right. Uh, Eisegesis is an interpretation of scripture that reads the interpreter's own ideas or bias into the text. So yeah. exegesis says, this is what the text means, and eisegesis says, this is what I want the text to mean. Yeah, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, any method of interpretation that allows allegory, for example, to be imposed on the text is, is destined for problems. Yeah. It would mean that each person could <laughs> arrive at wildly different conclusions about who God is, the, the way he describes himself to us in scripture. Allegorical, allegorical interpretations really have no more authority than the person making up the meaning for the text. Right. Which means that anyone claiming a personal allegorical meaning of the Bible is actually claiming that their mind, rather than the text, is the source of, the, uh, of, of authority, really, for the interpretation. Now, the Bible needs to say the same thing in each language it's translated into, or it, it can't be, uh, be the means of communication or communicating the truth to us that, right. that yeah. Christians believe it to be. So ultimately, anyone accepting someone's personal allegorical interpretation really trusts the interpreter 
um, rather than the text itself. Right. And, and this is why CMI, like many evangelical organizations and evangelical, uh, evangelical Christians in general, state that the scripture should be interpreted according to the literal, grammatical, historical method of interpretation. Right. The word literal is often confusing today. Uh, when used in the area of hermeneutics, it doesn't mean a, a, a wooden literalism. For example, when the psalmist asks God to hide him, quote, in the shadows of your wings, no one is suggesting here that God has literal, he has literal wings and, and, and feathers and that kind of thing. It's a figure of speech. Right. We, 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 you know that from scripture. The literal historical grammatical interpretation simply means that you interpret the text in the way that it's written. To interpret a figure of speech literally means you interpret it as a figure of speech. That's right. interpreting it literally. At, at a basic level, the Bible should be treated in the same way we treat any other literature, ancient or, or modern. Take it as it's written. For example, don't interpret plays by Shakespeare as historical records. <laughs> They're plays. You, you interpret them as plays. When Jesus uses parables, for example, you interpret them as parables. Right and interpret the historical accounts in Scripture as historical accounts. Right. The, the, the Bible does give us clear principles of interpretation, and sure. we're going to see those when we come back. Creation Magazine is a 56-page, full-color family magazine that is an essential tool for anyone wanting to immunize their family against the anti-biblical worldviews bombarding us from all sides. With no paid advertising, every page is full of powerful articles, ammunition to intelligently discuss nature, history, science, the Bible, and related subjects. Although written for lay people, every effort is made to ensure the content is technically accurate so that even experts are satisfied, and young children look forward to the section written especially for them. Visit creation.com to get your your subscription. All right, if you just tuned in, this week we're talking about how should the Bible be interpreted. That's our topic. And as mentioned, uh, the Bible does give us clear principles of interpretation. For it example, does, yeah. you know, in the, in the scripture where it says, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways, we do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's in 2 Corinthians 4, 2. Right, and here's another passage to consider. This one's from Proverbs here, Proverbs 8, 8 to 9. Uh, All the utterances of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. They are all straightforward to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. So you can see in just these two passages uh, how the Bible talks about speaking plainly, yes, straightforwardly, yeah. without deception or distortion, etc. Basically, to take the Bible as plainly written. Right, and obviously we shouldn't distort it. If we shouldn't distort it, then there must be a wrong way to interpret it that results in a in a distorted meaning. Right. <laughs> yes, but, but some might say that even though these two passages make it clear that that we're to take the Bible as plainly written. Uh, they're not enough to base our whole understanding of Scripture. Okay. But, but just imagine if there was a book uh, in the Bible that, that spoke definitively on how we should understand it, that, that read something like the following. Okay? You, you should not take these words as plainly written. Let's say that's in uh, First Opinions 1.1. 1, 1. <laughs> now, now, if you look at that statement, right? Um, obviously, it's a bit of a problem. A made-up <laughs> statement, yeah. Um, now, if you take it as plainly written, well, you've broken the command given. Right. But yeah. if you don't take it as plainly written, then it can't mean what it plainly yeah, says. It's, yeah, it, it's a self-refuting statement. Yeah. So, so it's, it's valueless. And, and right. similarly, if the Bible stated anywhere that we should not take it as plainly written, it'd, it'd be valueless. Right, yeah. So anyone saying that the Bible need not be taken as plainly written <laughs> is lost. It's, it's a <laughs> losing argument there. Yeah. They lose any authority that the Bible might have because if you don't take the words in the form that the author intended them, uh, then, then all just becomes human opinion, not, right. not revelation from the Creator God. When, when talking about biblical authority, consider 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture... Here's the key part. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God or woman of God might be complete, equipped for every good work. Theologian Herman Hoeksema uh, said it best, said it very clearly. All of scripture is given to us that we might understand it. All of it is adapted to our human mind so that even though there may, may be many things in the revelation of God which we cannot fathom, 
there's nothing in it that is contrary to human intelligence and logic. Either the logic of revelation is our logic, or there is no revelation. I actually have that next to my desk at the at CMI's office. E, e, you know, either God's logic is our logic, or there can be no revelation. Right, right. And obviously, there are going to be things about an infinite God that we're not going to understand. But that's not really, that, that's not really the point. That that, that we still need to be, be able to understand the logic from Scripture. Uh, now, those in opposition to the grammatical, historical, the the, the method that that method of hermeneutic, uh, or or perhaps don't truly understand what the method entails will often bring up objections like what about parables what and poetic language in the bible are you saying that uh, uh, that we should take them as plainly written they argue that because there is symbolic imagery at all in certain passages in scripture that the grammatical historical method is unjustifiable right. they'll say well jesus taught in parables so it's obvious you don't always take the quote plain reading of scripture However, this is a misunderstanding of what the method means. It really is. Yes, when somebody speaks or writes um, using poetry or parables to teach, we should not cease to interpret the words as plainly written. Rather, we should take the words as plainly stated in context to right. understand what they mean quite clearly. And we're going to give you some examples of this when we come back. If Arnold Schwarzenegger had a pet cow, I can almost guarantee it would be a Belgian blue. These cows are incredibly muscled and have very little fat. Many people think of this breed as evolution in action because a mutation in its DNA has brought about a supposed improvement. But if microbes really did turn into Belgian blue cows, which is what evolution teaches, this would require the addition of lots of new DNA information to turn the relatively simple genome of a bacteria into the vastly more complicated genome of a cow. However, in the case of Belgian blue cows, we see the opposite because no new information has been added. In fact, a mutation has corrupted the myostatin gene, which normally stops muscles growing too big. So information has been lost. The cows have lost control over muscle growth. So Belgian blue cows have devolved, not evolved. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So our subject today is how should the Bible be interpreted, and we just uh, we're just discussing how some people have uh, pointed to the use of parables, right. uh, poetry in the Bible to try to get around a plain reading of Scripture is really what they're trying to do. Yeah. Now, a, a simple example um, to help understand this principle would be if, if you know if I went out with a friend and I said something like, "Look, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse." <laughs> <laughs> It would be obvious to anyone versed in common English not to interpret that in some kind of wooden, literal sense. Yeah, you know, it's pretty I, gross. Yeah, I want to eat a horse, right? Um, be, well, why? Because yeah. horses are generally too large uh, to be eaten in, in, in one sitting or something like that. The plain understanding is just that I'm, I'm really hungry, That's right? Everybody would understand that. Or, or similarly, if I was, you know, you heard someone declaring that their girlfriend was their, their moon and their sun, you know, <laughs> you're not going to think that they're, they're saying she's, you know, some kind of orbiting, you know, object orbiting in space or some, you know, enormous ball of flaming superheated gas or anything like Hope that. Not. You know, <laughs> that belongs to them, right? <laughs> now, we, we can't downplay the fact that scripture contains some very sophisticated and sometimes difficult passages to understand. That they, they are there. However, we cannot use passages that are hard to comprehend to somehow undermine the truth of our ability to understand the passages that are quite easy to understand. Right. This would be like saying that a math, should, uh, a math student shouldn't accept uh, conclusions in basic arithmetic because there are some equations that exist that are extremely challenging. Right. And so, <laughs> yeah. So you've got calculus, but doesn't that work. means one plus one doesn't have to mean two. Yeah. 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 So some are going to say that different takes on Genesis are similar to different denominational stances, right? They're going to say, yep. well, so what's the fuss here? The difference is that, you know, if you're having a discussion amongst theologians from different, um, you know, denominations, e each one is going to quote scripture as to why they, you know, believe in their denominational stance. To back stance. up their position. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, even many cults point to passages in the, in the Bible to kind of justify their, their views, of course. Right. But regarding the understanding of Genesis, Christians often quote sources of information outside of Scripture to back up what to back up their stance, yeah. uh, to, to support what they believe regarding what they think Scripture says. 
uh, they, they say scientists have proven the earth is millions of years old. Yeah, and, they didn't get and, that and, from scripture. It, that didn't come from scripture, no, it came from, from outside ideas. And, and therefore the word day doesn't have to mean a literal day in Genesis. So outside ideas yep. have changed, the, have, have influenced their hermeneutic. This is of course extremely dangerous. Uh, it, it could it could then be applied to any biblical subject uh, anywhere in scripture if you use the outside ideas all the time. Exactly. We see the same idea in those liberal camps trying to justify their acceptance of homosexuality, uh, biblically, for example. Right. Uh, take well-known UK evangelical um, Bible expositor, Dr. Roy Clements. He, he's a pastor of a leading Baptist church uh, for, in England for over 20 years. And now, he, his view is that same-sex uh, relationships can, uh, between consenting adults um, you know, can be acceptable before God. Right. So what is his justification for such a radical departure from what Scripture plainly says? Well, he says, thinking evangelicals, quote, have never yielded to the blinker dogma which insists the world must have been made in seven days because Genesis says so. Now note here that he admits to what Genesis plainly says. <laughs> they have recognized that it is no part of Christian discipleship to turn a blind eye to discoveries of science which indicates that the earth is millions of years old. A surprising number of our most able scientists are evangelical Christians, thoroughly persuaded of the general accuracy of evolutionary theory. Okay, so he's using ideas, again, from outside the Bible, you can see it plainly there in that yep. quote, in his interpretive framework. Right. Therefore, he says, because the issue of homosexuality, no less than the debate about creation and evolution, raises key questions of a scientific nature, only a fundamentalist would suggest that, because the Bible has no idea of homosexual orientation, that this modern psychological understanding of what it means to be gay has to be rejected. Wow. Well, the, the implications are clear. Right. Science, and, and, and really it's just faulty interpretations of the facts, of is, course, is yeah. what, what he should be saying, has shown that the plain reading of the Bible is wrong, so ignore it and modify scripture, uh, whatever scripture means, in order to make it uh, get in line with what the latest science shows, or the latest uh, fallible interpretation. This kind of compromise is, is it's intellectual suicide for Christians. That's right. For anybody who wants to know what God says. Now, we have a great book. You can find it on creation.com. Just go to the web store there. It's a book called Christianity for Skeptics. Yes. And it really tackles a lot of these types of issues. It makes it, it, it's written in a very plain uh, fashion. I really, really do appreciate the book every time I, I have to look it up for references or anything like that. And you can actually get uh, a copy of this by going to the website. And uh, as you're checking out, you can put in the code. Uh, you can see it on the screen there, CMLCFS. Uh, Creation Magazine Live, Christianity, Christianity for, for Skeptics. skeptics. Yeah. And you can get 30% off the book. Um, and it covers a lot of different topics. It, it does, yeah. It's got chap My favorite chapter in the whole book is, is, uh, is Atheism Rational. <laughs> that one, that one is, uh, uh, you read, because that's what atheists are saying, right? They're saying right. That, that, well, the atheist position, we're, we're the rational ones, and we've got logic, and we're following the and facts. Science, and so of course. You read that, cha that, that chapter is worth the price of the book by itself, and you're getting, viewers get 30% off, so that's great. Yeah. And there's chapters on uh, what's the evidence that God exists, and what about other religions? I mean, uh, Islam, do, for do, example, do, uh, how do we large area there? Yep. Is, is Jesus the only way? Is, it, is that really true? Yeah. And so, and he handles um, the uh, the Eastern religions as well, and just yeah. a lot of the philosophical uh, topics. Because many times we, we cover the science aspects, right? But this is a yeah. great uh, a great book that covers a wide range of things. It is. So we'll be back. What are the theological consequences of adding millions of years to Genesis? How does it impact doctrines such as the gospel, sin, the atonement? Refuting compromise is the most powerful biblical and scientific defense of a straightforward view of Genesis. Loaded with scientific support for a recent creation in six real days, it demolishes all attempts to twist the biblical text in order to insert millions of years, bringing clarity into an area usually mired in confusion. Must reading for Bible college students and anyone involved in church leadership or teaching. Get your copy at creation.com. Our subject today is how should the Bible be interpreted? We just saw a quote from uh, a man named Clements saying, well, we don't have to take Genesis as literal. Why should we take uh, the Bible talking about homosexuality as literal, etc.? He's being consistent. If that's your hermeneutic, he's being consistent. Exactly. But, you know, modern science doesn't support belief in floating axe heads, talking donkeys, <laughs> people walking on, on unfrozen water, virgins giving birth, right. um, dead people coming back to life, etc. So a big one. It, to be consistent with Clement's view, and, and as many uh, professing believers, Christians should say that these events 
never really, really occurred, right. which is to say that the Bible isn't true, Christ isn't risen, and that Christianity is false. And this is exactly how the theolo uh, liberal theologians reason, and they're just being consistent. Yeah. Uh, there's so much more that, that could be said about this, the, the, the kind of biblical compromise that we don't have, have time to cover. There, there's many different varieties out there. You can read many articles on this subject if you go to creation.com slash compromise. That's going to take you to a, a list of many articles. You can read the titles there, and uh, it's a lot, lot of stuff there. Uh, things like uh, the gap theory, progressive creation, framework hypothesis, the day-age theory, theistic evolution, retroactive death. There's, there's, yeah. there's an interesting one. Um, I also highly recommend Dr. Jonathan Sarfati's excellent work, Refuting Compromise. It's one of the best resources, we think, uh, supporting a straightforward interpretation of the text. It actually, by, by, by showing that, it actually shows how, uh, it actually teaches you how to interpret the Bible. Right. Uh, straightforward interpretation of the text, and it includes the latest scientific discoveries that support biblical creation from a straightforward reading of the text. Right. You know, in the final analysis, Genesis just means what it says. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's really a lot simpler yeah. than a lot of people think. That's right. <laughs> God created recently, and, and the earth is around 6,000 years old. That's what the plain reading of the scripture says. And, and for, you know, a few details on, on how, um, you know, you can come to understand that there's a great article at creation.com slash 6,000 years titled, How Does the Bible Teach, uh, you know, that the Earth's 6,000 years old? Yes. The creation, evolution, young earth, old earth debates among Christian believers really need to begin and end with sound exegetical principles rather than a battle over various interpretations of scientific facts. Right. That, that has no end, it seems, because whatever scripture says on the subject of origins should be the ultimate authority for, for Bible-believing Christians. And if we get the biblical interpretation right, the science is going to support it anyway. Of course, Christians that abandon the grammatical historical method of interpretation are shooting themselves in the foot, and informed skeptics reveal uh, their inconsistencies easily. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, take atheist and anti-creationist biologist uh, Jerry Coyne's uh, review uh, of two books um, written by theistic evolutionists. Here's what he says. As an atheist, like Carl Giberson, Kenneth Miller rejects a literal interpretation of the Bible. After discussing the fossil, fossil record, he contends that a literal reading of the Genesis story is simply not scientifically valid, concluding that theology does not and cannot pretend to be scientific, but it can require of itself that it be consistent with science and conversant with it. But this leads to a conundrum. Why reject the uh, story of creation in Noah's Ark? Because we know that animals evolved, but nevertheless accept the reality of the virgin birth and resurrection of Christ, where are, which are equally at odds with science. After all, biological research suggests the impossibility of human females reproducing asexually or of anyone reawakening three days after death. Clearly, Mil Miller and Giberson have some theological views that are not consistent with science. Yeah, Bible skeptics obviously get it. As Coyne uh, clearly says here, Christians that abandon the plain reading of Scripture have abandoned the ability to intelligently defend the Bible and hence the Christian beliefs uh, from which they come. Now, this, this show, Creation Magazine Live, it's based on Creation Magazine. You can see a free co sample copy of Creation Magazine. Go to creation.com slash free mag and you can get that magazine it's a fantastic faith building tool uh, and you can view a few copy a free copy there online if you like it subscribe and right. we'll, we'll we will see you next week our topic is was darwin a plagiarist that's next week on creation magazine live see you then